Okay. Hello and welcome to my talk I threw together yesterday uh, with a beautiful title, Why Port 10,000 Lines of C++ Code to Rust? And what I learned about this. Um, I'm a visiting hacker from Bochum. Um, I'm working in the industry. I'm currently doing only open source. Um, and I'm starting till uh, 2020. Um, computer security and my interests are mostly cryptography and um, reverse engineering. And I will talk a bit about the reverse engineering uh, topic here. Um, I don't have much about the actual reverse engineering project I'm doing because I wasn't anticipating that anybody here um, cares about that. So it's more about Rust and a bit critique of modern C++. Um, but now that there are some people who are interested in this stuff, I'd, maybe I'll talk a bit more about the actual reverse engineering. Okay, the reverse engineering, um, this is what reverse engineering looks like in reality, in the industry. Um, that's IDA Pro, that's a that standard tool for reverse engineering, um, especially in the security industry. Um, it looks like Windows 15, uh, 95. It, feels like it, and it's mostly out from that era. Um, it's definitely one of the best tools we have there, so there, um, that's, there's a reason why it's used in the industry. But it costs 800 bucks uh, upwards. It more or less ignores the results of the last 10 years um, program analysis research. Um, so around five years ago when I wanted to reverse engineer something on Linux. This is a, at that time was still a Windows only tool. Um, I thought I can do that better. So, oh, that's unfortunate. Well, there would be my project. Well, the project is called Panopticon, the all seeing eye. Um, I started it in September. 2011, I think. Um, at that time, it was a C++ project. Um, I was just trying out Haskell, and I initially wanted to use Haskell. Um, but the problem with Haskell is you have libraries for support vector machines and SAT solvers, but you don't have libraries for UIs to display an image, to display a button you can press. Um, why there are bindings for Qt, they're either out of date or um, not very good uh, ported. And the fact that Haskell is extremely different from all other libraries and tools you have, it's hard to port libraries. And in the end, I had to learn that I'm probably not smart enough for Haskell. Um, so I used the hammer I know, which was C++. Um, I started with C++ around 10 years ago. Um, at that point, uh, C++ started to, started to well, move forward again a bit. We had this um, C++ OX initially called it, um, then it became 2010, and then becomes, became 2011. And finally it released, and we had C++ 11, which feels like a whole new language. So um, I will rant a bit about C++ and the C++ community and how they solve problems, but it's definitely it's a great language, and um, in case you can't use Rust or Haskell, uh, it's definitely worth checking out. So if you maybe learned C++ years ago and did not have time or um, did not enjoy much uh, the C++ and didn't want to check out the new words, it's definitely worth it. Um, well, even if in the end I just threw the project away and did it all in Rust again. Um, well, the project at that time used what people call modern C++, um, which is mostly template metaprogramming and heavy use of templates um, that became the driving factor behind um, modern C++ because it helps you to build abstractions that are type safe, that kind of integrate into the language, um, at the expense of usability, but it helps you to actually build new language constructs. And 
Well, you, as a C++ programmer, you learn how to push that language construct beyond its limits. So, what's the problem with C++? That's code from the last C++ version of Panopticon. Um, I would try to figure out all the errors here. I'm not sure if I managed to. Well, let's start with the first and the last line that ensure. Um, that's what other languages call assert. Uh, so if that, uh, the, the expression in the, brace, uh, in the uh, parents aren't true, uh, isn't true, that program is, is uh, well, blows up. Um, there's an assert in C++, but that calls just exit. Um, to ensure I build is a bit smarter, um, but more or less do that. Um, first problem is C++ and C ensure is a macro, so it doesn't behave like a function. Um, the initial versions of ensure were compiled out in release mode, and this means that everything you did there just disappeared in release mode. So if, like in the last line, you do something that's actually um, needed even in release mode, like inserting a value into this lambda. Um, container, your application stops working in release mode. So you have something that looks like a function, but doesn't behave like one. Mm. Kind of bad. In Rust, you had this bang at the end. That would help you to, uh, well, figure out that maybe that's another function. Um, okay, normally in C, you do it all in uppercase, but nobody's forcing you to do this. Um, okay, next up, the, the <laughs> The remainder of this function is just one function call <laughs> inside another function call. Um, well, this accumulate um, function call is just what Rust calls fold, and it's get fed to, uh, to iterators. Um, in C++, you, from most of you probably know, um, you don't have this one iterator that's um, called next, next, next until it ends, but you have two iterators that point to the beginning and past the end, and you're supposed to move one of these iterators towards the end. Um, you can only compare them by equality, so if you move one of these iterators past the end, you maybe blow up your function. So they are, by, while they are the generalization of pointers, they are strictly worse from the safety perspective. So instead of looking if they're smaller or equal, you can just check for equality. Um, in Rust, it would be pretty hard to do this uh, because your iterator will one day or one uh, situation will start to um, just return none. Um, the rest of this function um, computes some value in some uh, graph algorithm. It's not so important, but uh, what you can later see is that, well, there's C++, um, at least you are told to, but there are more interpretations of C++ uh, one for GCC, one for Clang, and one for Microsoft. Um, and all of those interpret that standard differently, so you have to anticipate all of them. Um, actually, I implemented most of the stuff in G GCC and ported it to Microsoft Compiler and it took me weeks uh, until it finally compiled. Um, just because sometimes Microsoft, as you can see here, uh, believes that you don't need that type name uh, keyword. And GCC has a different opinion on that. And this isn't an option, so you either have to add the type name or you don't, so you have to add this macro just because there's this one uh, keyword either missing or it's superfluous. Um, well, the rest of that is a lambda function that looks absolutely horrible. You, you start with the uh, parents and the ampersand, and after that you have to write out all the arguments. Again, there's some limited type inference, but not in the Rust way. So again, extremely verbose. It doesn't help anybody. If it had type inference here, at least I would have uh, skipped that macro, uh, macro for the Microsoft compiler, right? Uh, and at the end, of course, uh, we compute the maximum. Um, we cast it to an int and return it into an unsigned int. And this is depending on your compiler, flex, either a warning or Nothing, it just works. As long as really not cited and not below zero. So this is most of the problems. I, I tried to find a representative line in Panopticon where I could show you that C++ is terrible, but C++ is not expressible enough to have all the terrible into one line. 
So I have this representative <laughs> snippet. Um, yeah, why did I start with Rust? So um, I found out about Rust around the 09, I think, uh, where there was still some confusing amount of tildes and at science, it all looked like Perl. Um, <laughs> but what I heard about first and what, what, what made me fell in love with initially was that Rust has sometimes are called tech enums. Um, the possibility that you have something like a union in C, but the instance of, of the union know which part they are and you can match on them. Um, of course, every language construct you can come up with is already implemented in C, uh, in C++, using boost libraries, using template meter programming. Um, they tell you that everything is fine, it works the same as in all other languages. If you make a mistake, it doesn't compile. Um, what they don't tell you is that doesn't compile means you get an error message that is longer than the Bible. Uh, you have no idea what's happening, only that you did something wrong involving templates. Um, we there's, started, there's a contest for, contest for generating the biggest error, na error message. <laughs> <laughs> there's usually, a, well, it's not about getting the biggest one, that's easy. You have to get a specific number of gigabytes. Of gigabytes? <laughs> the one who gets closest wins. And That's amazing. The, the code you, and, the, and the code also has to be as <laughs> there's, there's basically a contest, contest for getting the, the largest number. And you have to you get points for getting the smallest code that generates it. But you also have to get, get a specific size because you can, can just emit in infinite error, error messages okay. by, by recursion. Uh, so, so, so that's a variant of the busy, busy fever problem. I so think. that's basically a thing in C++. So that kind of tells a story, I think. Absolutely great, absolutely great. Uh, the, the thing where I stopped and thought maybe this template pro metaprogramming thing isn't the greatest idea is when I found out about the boost way of making these error messages parsable um, for a human user, is that they built upon that idea of con uh, concepts that will never appear in C++ um, and have an error messages essentially you have an identifier for each of the possible errors and you put a bunch of stars for, uh, before the identifier and after it. So that's a real, still a valid identifier and it shows up into your one gigabytes or so error messages so you know at least where to lock it for. Um, that's the point where I stopped using template metaprogramming. Um, okay, back to Rust. Um, yeah, this is a shortened version of what happens in Panopticon often is when I uh, match against these, uh, well, tech unit implementation done in Boost. It's called uh, Boost Variant. Um, the idea is you build a function object that overloads the call operator for all the possible um, alternatives in the union. And well, you put an, a special function, apply visitor, and well, depending on which uh, uh, option this instance is, it will call that and function. Um, great. And of course, if you miss one of those options, it doesn't comply. You get five gigabits error message. Um, first, this is extremely verbose because you have to write these function objects again and again. Uh, you can deconstruct a value. So if you, if like here, I want to uh, use that add uh, arguments, I have to painstakingly take their values out and match on top of them. So let's say if I have this add and want a special version uh, of the at where the first argument is in constant value, I can just match it in Rust. And in C++, I have to write another function object that matches on the first argument. And depending on that, implement all the functions. So pain in the ass. Um, that's actually, uh, that's probably not the most love feature here, but it's actually the one that made me use Rust for Panopticon. Um, there's another one I will only show briefly because I don't understand it now either. Um, I, at one point, I implemented the borrow checker in, in Panopticon without knowing it, of course, and um, it's all runtime checked on shitty and not well thought out. But I had the problem that the program was more or less in front end for the database, and you pull the value out of the database, do something on it, and write it back. 
Um, and while I'm working on the database value, I have to lock the database, at least that value, so another thread doesn't uh, start um, modifying it. And I built some wildly uh, hard to understand um, smart pointer that did all that. Um, or at least I tried to. As you can see, I commented out the right uh, function because I never managed to actually implement it correctly. Um, I never understand sort of why, but when I came to Rust, I realized what I did there was more or less build a border checker. That was one time checked. And um, this was another point for me where I thought, well, maybe Rust is the right way instead of C++ and doing everything yourself. Okay, so when Rust came, uh, when Rust 1 came out um, around a year ago, um, I started to toying with that idea. The problem is, the project I started now five years ago uh, um, had already four rewrites. And I was programming it all. It wasn't one my project, all alone. Past, most, of, most of the time, it wasn't even on GitHub or so. Um, it was always 10, around 10K, never actually surpassed the 10K limit because I always started to rewrite it when I realized I had <laughs> I programmed myself in a corner where I couldn't come out, like with the borrow checker thing. Um, so I thought about it, but in the end I started rewriting it pretty much a year ago. Um, I had no prior experience with Rust. I had no idea how to program Rust. I read that book, or at least half of it, and I just downloaded the compiler and started programming. And it's more or less a straightforward translation from the C++ code. Um, there was no object orientation, or at least not in the case that we have uh, sub-objects or object trees. Um, so I could translate it more or less directly uh, to Rust, and it took me around four months. It's hard to tell because, of course, the fifth rewrite, I learned a bit more about the other four, so I programmed it a bit differently. And um, of course, it was a learning experience. So um, I started with the basic part, the utility libraries. And <laughs> the, this, this foundational part of Panopticon is actually the worst design because I had no idea about Rust and just programmed it like I thought was a good idea. Um, so parts of that changed again. But um, after the four month mark, I was around that point that I could do the same with the Rust version as I could do with the C one. Um, yeah, it was an enjoyable experience, definitely. Um, the compiler messages was really helpful. Um, when I programmed in Haskell, I always had, had the same uh, situation. I had no idea about the language. I read the book and I thought, was, oh, I understand this. And I started programming and I realized I don't know anything. And um, the compiler gives you helpful messages. And why don't you try it? Here, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. That doesn't compile. Or here, type inference doesn't work. Mm. And it tells you, so why don't you put a typing argument here, or do this, or switch that arguments. And you do that, and you get an error message that's even longer. So it doesn't, this never ends. But with Rust, it actually, it actually worked. So I got that error message back. So why don't you put a named lifetime here? I had no idea what a named lifetime is. I know lifetimes is something with the board checker. Um, and I put. I more or less copied the, I, the, the, the thing that, that the compiler tells me, and it worked. And this, 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 this happened multiple times at different uh, well, levels of code complexity. And this is the thing that got me into Rust and um, prevented me from giving up, like I did with Haskell. Oh, oh I found bugs. I found bugs by straightforward translation of code from C++ to Rust. And <laughs> there's this situation, I had this graph uh, type template that more or less was a container for graphs. And I started to translate it like I did all of the other code. And there was some position where, there was some code where I deleted vertices. And first I deleted the edges that connected to the vertices and then deleted the vertices itself. And I couldn't for the life of mine get this code compiled, so it took me hours. And after a day, I realized there was iterator and validation bug in there. Uh, the borrow checker found that. I, the C++ version had this bug for years and never came up. Um, but this straightforward translation from uh, C++ to Rust found that problem. So 
That's why I'm Rust fan. Uh, and Cargo makes development easier, especially on Windows. Um, getting all the dependencies in, with the Microsoft compiler that's pushing eight gigabytes um, into a VM is work of for a week. So that definitely, I, I don't know if Cargo is the best solution for everything, um, especially packaging, but I come to that later. Um, yeah, what's not so great, or what's the problems I had, um, or have? There are no libraries for anything. Um, so we're, we are again in the Haskell world. Um, there are GUI libraries. Um, I use QML. Um, There's some kind of JavaScript prolog love child that helps you to um, specify your GUIs and uh, do most of the programming in JavaScript. And this is really nice, but the bindings for this QML uh, part in Rust are pretty rough. Um, when I started it, the guy that programmed it was already working for a month or so. And um, he started to comment out parts where he didn't know whenever this was safe and where it worked with the threading. And uh, what I did was fork the project, um, remove the comments so I could use threading again without thinking about safety and uh, put some shitty code on top of that, and I'm using this for now. Um, so I have this private fork where I sometimes pull back changes from the uh, original project, and um, this is, it kind of works, but I sometimes have crashes, sometimes the stuff doesn't compile on specific machines, so that's really bad. A QML RS is the project, um, these guys need help. Um, it's, it, it's moving, it's moving forward. Um, but very slowly. Um, there's not much documentation on macros. Macros are a bit the template meter programming um, for Rust. And I'm part of enjoying that because I'm from that C world. Um, how to get, how to push that construct beyond its limits. Um, on the other hand, I don't think Rust needs to be as complicated as C and needs to be as expert friendly as um, C++. Still, um, I'm using some pretty complicated macros, and currently I have to use a shell script to generate the macros, which again, would generate Rust code. Um, maybe there's a smarter way to do this. I had problems with the documentation. It's all really basic. Um, what you can match and how to apply this um, concept of these matches to real world code. Um, I actually copied some um, MOS assembler uh, to build my uh, macros, so it's kind of learning by doing. Hmm. Oh yeah, yes, this with the, uh, with the cargo. Um, I actually one of the persons would actually read that Debian packaging guide, and they're pretty anal about some parts. For example, you can't have um, network access while building applications. That's pretty difficult to do with Cargo and so. Um, also with Cargo, you have some dependencies, dependencies that aren't obvious. So for example, with the QMLRs, you need a C++ glue code uh, between the C++ world and the um, Rust world. And that's compiled with CMake. So you have this dependency on CMake that doesn't show up in your um, Cargo file. That's kind of bad. Um, I don't really have a solution for that. Uh, currently, I just compile everything, put it in the package, and people can unpack it and start it. And it's everything compiled statically, so it works pretty good. Um, but I'm not sure whenever that's the best practice. Um, but I think that's a problem the distributions have to solve. Um, because if you look at Ruby and um, Node.js and uh, Python, they all have their own package manager. And if I have to um, update my system, I have to not only emerge, I have to gem update and npm update and uh, cabal update and pip update and maybe cargo update is another one. So oh, that's already everything for me. Um, if you want, you can check out my disassembly project. It's on GitHub and um, it already was on Hacker News, I think, three weeks ago. So the project blew up and I have 900 worthless internet points on. GitHub now. Um, of course, I'm on the IRC too. 
Uh, you can what, look at the code. I know it's a lot of code, but I'm not a really good Rust programmer, so there are always ways to improve my code. I merge everything, pretty much <laughs> everything. Um, that's it. Question. Um. The one guy from Mozilla is PC Walton, right? Have you looked into his um, Rust binding for uh, system agnostic interfaces, lib, lib UI or something yeah. it's called? No. I, what, what does it do? <laughs> It's, it's, it's basically a, C, a, C, a system agnostic C binding for which he, he wrote a, a Rust wrapper or uh, whatever, um, which allows you to basically um, uh, write your, your, your interface in Rust and have it then display kind of, kind of the same on, on Mac, Linux, and, and Windows. Okay. Um, without C++, so. And, uh, without C++ is always a good uh, thing. Um, <laughs> The problem with that is the QML code is a lot of work, and part of the UI code and layouting the graphs is done in JavaScript. This was a lot of work. And I'm not seeing the upsides of really throwing everything away and doing it in another UI library, um, especially because in QML you can do many things that are extremely complicated in C++ and probably in Rust too, like animations and um, transparency and stuff like that uh, very easily. Um, and I'm really a fan of QML, and I don't think if it's worth um, changing the UI library, at least now. But I definitely check it out. So, uh, what was the name of the original uh, de decompiler you were trying to rewrite? Ida Pro. Yeah. So, how do you feel? Do you feel like you've come kind of as far as you want to go in terms of getting back up to that level of functionality, or do you feel like you have a lot more farther to go in terms of having a suitable decompiler on Linux that kind of can do anything? Um, well, the idea of Panopticon is not to emulate or re implement Ida Pro. Um, because IDA Pro is, is, is definitely a local maximum and it's a great tool. But um, the last 10 years of program analysis research um, showed that you can do definitely more, um, especially uh, with semantics based analysis. Um, most of the tools you have now, and IDA is one of the best, is only syntax based. So you have um, a dis disassembler that tells you, well, this sequence of bytes is that mnemonic, and you know what that mnemonic does because you read that thousand page inter manual um, and what you do what the good guys uh, what the really uh, good reverse engineers know is that they what these monies do what the side effects they have and read that code and a computer couldn't do this better faster and um, I believe that applying tools like abstract interpretation um, bound model checking um, type inference onto this uh, code would be would help a human uh, uh, reverse engineer definitely to speed things up or automate things and um, make sense of code faster. And this is the point where I want to go with Panopticon. Um, there are a lot of research prototypes that do part of parts of that, um, but they're all research, research prototypes. They are mostly done in Objective Pascal, uh, Objective Camel, or Haskell, or there's some Java code that compiles years ago on that Ubuntu 10 version of that PhD student, and um, that's it. And these, I can understand this because yeah, these guys are from university, they're not paid to build usable software, but to build great research prototypes. Um, but what I want to do with Panopticon is just take this last 10 years of um, research and implement it into a tool that's usable for people who don't have the knowledge, who are not PhD students, um, and a tool that can be deployed easily. It just works like other Pro. Um, so there's no original thought in Panopticon. It's all reading papers and implementing that stuff. And if you had look at the issue tracker, there's a long list of things I want to do, then implement that abstract domain and implement a decompiler, definitely. Um, but there's a lot of work, and um, while I was busy porting the code to Rust last year, uh, maybe I get around uh, doing some useful stuff this year. <laughs> so, 
So you mentioned there was no good documentation on macros. I assume you're talking about macros by example and not compiler-based macros, right? I mean the, the macros rules. All right. There is a small book written by Daniel Keep. I think it even is called The Little Book on Macros. Oh. It's pretty good, but I suggest reading it at least three times <laughs> because its information density is so high. And there is one example of a macro that's like 200 lines of just generic macro code. And it shows basically everything you can do with macros, <coughs> including custom conventions to like build pull-based macros that call themselves with other arguments. It's pretty fantastic. You should give it a try. OK, I, I will definitely check it out. <laughs> there are two versions of that book um, of different different timeliness. The older one will have a, a, a notice on the, uh, at, at, the, at the top um, linking you to the new version. OK. One of, one of those also had a, like, I think the little one is the older one, and he also said it's not appropriate because the book is rather large now, so. Maybe I just missed the point. You started up with, um, uh, well, uh, well, converting 10,000 lines of code. Um, so how many lines of code do you have now? Um, upwards to 10,000. Um, I don't know, I didn't check. Uh, when I was done with the conversion, actually, less. Um, it was around 8,000 or so. And I think it's probably more than 10,000 now, uh, mostly because there's stuff like an x86 disassembler in there. It takes a lot of code, or, but not a lot of thought. It's just copying the um, instructions from the menu into the code. I wrote some macros that make the code that matches uh, certain mnemonics uh, more or less look like what it looks in the um, manual. So this kind of pushes the amount of code upwards. Um, maybe if I come around to put some documentation in the project, <laughs> the amount of lines, at least in that code files, will uh, exceed 15K. But from your feeling, it seems about the same. You don't save large amounts of code. I, I save definitely around one to 2,000 lines of code. Um, but it's hard to tell if this really the expressiveness of Rust or just me throwing code away where I realize this can be done easier or it's just not worth it. Um, so as I said, it's not it's really one-to-one -one translation because I, of course, did some things better the fifth time as I did the fall <laughs> before. Um, from my gut feeling, I would say I maybe had less line, maybe 1,000 less lines, at least from that uh, variant thing there. These get very verbose with time. Um, but it's definitely readable, um, even if it's less code. Um, and it's worth, was worth it. So how much of that is actually QML code? Yeah, again, bit, please. How much of that is QML code? Uh, it's not part of uh, the QML part uh, didn't change much. So that's why I had to fix, uh, not really fix, it made it worse, uh, that QML project. And so I can reuse that, at least that QML code, uh, because that took already months to build. So if one of us wanted to wanted to like uh, help you out here and there, but has no idea what he or she is doing in regards to, uh, to your actual domain mm. you're dealing with. Um, what is the, the, the unit test coverage and, and, and the, the, um, how, how accessible is the code to someone who has no idea about the actual reverse engineering stuff? Is, is, there, mm. is it easy to just like say, I, Say someone who, who says, okay, I'm familiar with Rust, and I, could, I might be able to help here and there, but I have no idea what this is doing. So um, how is uh, it from, from the standpoint? Um, there's definitely code coverage. I have around three-fourths of the code covered of the unit tests. Um, there is documentation on the C++ version still uh, inside the tree. Um, the architecture didn't change. 
and most of the stuff still applies, even if the names of the functions kind of changed. Um, that's definitely happening if you just want to um, understand what's happening. Um, aside from that, reading the code, um, just downloading it, compiling it, uh, realizing it doesn't compile because I'm a terrible programmer, or your um, platform has something different, um, and sending a patch to me is already happening a lot. Um, aside from that, trying it out. I have some basic instructions how to use the program, and aside from that, I try to be, I try to write code as easy as possible, as, as readable as possible um, for people who are not from the domain, but that's a bit hard because on one end, you have the um, graph layouting part that's pretty complicated. Um, so the stuff that dot or graph list does. And sandwich between the part that does the disassembly and uh, semantic analysis and the graph algorithms. So it's probably pretty hard if you don't have computer science education. Um, but if you don't know about reverse engineering, I think, don't think that's that hard because most of the reverse engineering stuff is more or less um, computer science, normal stuff you do as computer science. Um, there are not many complicated tools there. The um, algorithms that are actually implemented are two files or so. The other parts are just decompiling that, uh, disassembling that stuff, getting the data structures, uh, serializing them. That's a big problem with me because um, I use this Rust serialize um, macro derive thing and the format changes every time I change something with the uh, structures. Um, that's, for, for example, a problem that doesn't have to do with uh, reverse engineering, but I have, and I have to solve before I release some fine version, um, because I can't tell my users that every time I change something minimal in the structures, they can't load their files. Uh, aside from that, you can always um, put issues and questions into the issue tracker. I will try to answer them. Uh, as good as possible. <laughs> Are there begin beginner issues? Like tagged uh, as easy or whatever, like you will find on the, on the Rust project? Um, I have on tagged some things as easy, but um, they are out of date now more or less, so I fixed them myself because, well, the project is running for five years now and uh, more or less nobody helped. So um, I stopped with this. Um, but now with especially the exposure I had with second use, um, more and more people come to me and ask me, hey, your code doesn't compile, or how can I help, or why does it work, why it doesn't work in my platform? Um, and I'm definitely trying to have issues where you can at least, where I can at least help you to actually compile code, uh, where you can uh, get into the code and fix easy stuff. Um, sometimes you have commits that have more warnings than template message, uh, error messages. Uh, uh, template errors along, um, fixing them is, for example, one approach. Is there anything in Rust you feel that should be improved or could be improved to help you out with your code? Um, well, the serialization library is definitely a problem. Um, the Serid or CD 30 uh, thing looks a bit better. I did not have time to try it out. Um, the problem I have, uh, I develop always in Rust stable, and now I'm fixed to 1.7 because Ubuntu 16 shipped that, actually, so um, when people want to use the project on Ubuntu, they don't have to install that Rust compiler as binary again, so they have, can install everything with AppGet, and that's a definitely a uh, nice thing, so I, I want really tools that work on standard uh, distributions. Um, and well, with Rust stable, you can use Clippy, you can not use uh, most of the cool parts of uh, the new, more, uh, well, easy usable uh, serialization libraries. Um, that's definitely a problem I have. Um, aside from that, I started, I, I tried to use specialization in my early Rust code and realized there's no specialization in Rust. Um, I think it's for the better, looking back, because that moves the project already in this template meter programming way I don't want to go again. Um, but sometimes definitely it would help. Um, I heard it's now part of Rust. Um, probably definitely worth checking out. Um, aside from that, I don't have much problems. Many people have problems with the tooling. 
Um, I don't use I use Vim, and sometimes I use Racer, which is already better than most of the tools you have for C++. And that's it. So.